Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a very uh, important session uh, titled Breaking the Glass Ceiling, Universities Promoting Equality and Nurturing Future Women Leaders. We have a very distinguished panel with us today to have this very important conversation on diversity and women leadership in the universities. Let me just start by introducing our panelists and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the issue. And then um, we'll have two rounds of questions. In the first round, we'll have all our panelists respond to a common question in the second rounds. In the second round, I will have specific questions for each of our panelists. So let me start by introducing Professor Dr. Ellen Baldry. She is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of New South Wales, Australia. Our second panelist is Professor Shirley Congdon. She is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Bradford at United Kingdoms. We have Professor Wendy Lano, who's Provost, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. And we also have Professor Dr. Tanushri Sharma, who's the Senior Additional Registrar at OP Jindal Global University. Um, so I want to start by a quote from a very prominent post-colonial feminist called Sarah Emmer, who I deeply admire. She wrote a book in 2012 titled On Being uh, Included, Racism and Diversity in Institutional Life. And she raised some very important questions on diversity, but she also says something very important about diversity and politics and I want to quote her, and I quote, it is certainly the case that responsibility for diversity and equality is unevenly distributed. It is also the case that the distribution of this work is political. If diversity and equality work is less valued by organizations, then to become responsible for this work can mean to inhabit institutional spaces that are also less valued. We know that the number of women in higher education leadership is on the rise in the world. Yet we know that there is a long way to go before we can achieve gender parity and increase women representation, especially in leadership positions. Our wonderful panel today is going to deliberate on this. My first question to everyone today on the panel is, the composition of this panel actually is a representation of how glass ceiling has been broken and shattered in academia in certain respects. What are your views on the evolution of women leadership in the university space? Have we moved beyond tokenism? Uh, may I please invite your comments? We can go with Professor Ellen first. Um, thank you. In some respects, there has been some breaking of the, the, the ceiling, but um, I'm not sure whether everybody who's listening and watching knows that higher education across the world really lags behind a lot of other organizations and disciplines and areas of work. So, um, you know, women in higher education do more than one and a half times the amount of the annual service compared to their male counterparts. Um, women outpace men in conferred doctoral degrees, yet men outnumber women two to one at the highest level of faculty ranks and in administrative leadership roles. Um, as, as well as on university boards. And um, a, a figure which is really disappointing is that worldwide, only 39 of the top 200 universities mm -hmm. are led by women. Um, and so I think in our discussion today, uh, it, I'll be so interested to uh, interact and discuss this with um, my peers on this panel. Maybe um, my final quick comment will be that um, we, we have stalled. So in Australia, for example, we have stalled in women, uh, you know, they're, they're being rising to parity. And so we are working extremely hard. We've copied something that um, the UK has, which is called SAID, uh, Athena Swan. And in Australia, we are trying to copy that it is very, very slow going. And so I think we need lots of new ideas or we need, um, you know, we need to decide that we will have um, quotas or we will have goals. And we will say, we have to have this percentage of women at senior leaderships in universities across the world in the next 10 years. Thank you so much. Uh... I'd like to now uh, invite uh, Shirley for her comments. Yeah, thank you. So I'll build upon um, Ellen's uh, comments, really. I mean, I think despite progress that has furthered gender equality in higher education, and this has been through law, policy, 
practice, the persistence of career uh, patterns and outcomes that differ from male counterparts, you know, they're, they're still very strong. There's been numerous reports and projects that have recognized that the gap continues to exist despite um, the principles that we all say we believe in. I think perhaps there's a debate to be had on whether people really recognize it as an issue and a problem and that we are losing um, talent and uh, the benefits from, from female skills. Um, there's definitely a higher number of women at UG level in, in positions in PG and PhD levels even that sort of get siphoned off into secondary career paths in higher education. And that might be because they see there's a lack of opportunity for them to progress in, 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 other, in other ways. So definitely an, an over-representation, as uh, uh, Ellen said, at the junior levels, but then a blockage um, and I think we see that in many, many organisations. The point about um, underrepresentation at the, uh, the top universities, as they're measured now, is definitely a factor that suggests there are structural inequalities at play globally uh, in relation to this. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'd like to invite Wendy for her comments. Yes, so I mean, I agree with my colleagues. Um, that we are beginning to see more women, however, at the senior levels of our organizations, um, very variable across institutions, across contexts. Uh, so at my own university, for example, we do have roughly parity in our senior leadership team. Uh, we've done a lot of work on our academic promotions process. So over the last five years, uh, we have begun to see an increase in women's success rates and academic promotions. And like many universities now, we have a formal equity, diversity, inclusion framework with action plans. We have mandatory unconscious bias training for promotions panels, recruitments panels. We run women in leadership courses. We have mentorship for women. So there's lots of activity in the space, but I absolutely agree with my colleagues that there is much more work to do. Um, my own view is that part of the problem is that we still tend to think in relatively narrow terms uh, about good forms of leadership or excellence. I think we need to be thinking much more holistically about what effective leadership approaches look like. Uh, we've got a lot of talk in this space. There's a lot of talk about participatory leadership, uh, emotional intelligence, engagement all around us, but I'm actually not convinced that we're fully enacting those new, more holistic conceptions of leadership. And then until we do that, it will be very hard to move the dial in the way that I think we all want to move the dial. Uh, the other comment I would make is that I think, again, we still assume particular forms of careers and career trajectories. And when we don't conform to them, we're somehow seen as exceptional or special circumstances. But things like pregnancy, caring for others, ill health, they're normal parts of lived experience for everyone. So how do we normalize those things and recognize that career trajectories are diverse and organize our institutions accordingly? So I think if we begin thinking in those kinds of ways, our institutions will begin to make more space for women rather than doing what we currently do, which I think is still ask women to behave more like men. And that's our challenge is to really open up that debate and discussion. Um, the final comment I would make is I think we need all our organizations to understand the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion, not, though, not just those of us who are underrepresented in our institutions, um, women, minority groups, indigenous peoples, and the like. It can't just be incumbent on us to be raising the issues 
and doing the work, we need everyone to take responsibility if we are to have more inclusive universities. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, absolutely. Um, may I invite Tanushri to please offer your comments? Uh, thank you, Deepika. I completely resonate with the, the ideas and opinions shared by my co-panelists. If I talk about India, I think uh, we have been able to break the glass door. Now, lot many women do enter workforce and universities as well. So if I may refer to uh, some of the percentages that I was able to note down, uh, you know, which are coming from one of the surveys conducted. So this was all India survey of higher education conducted uh, uh, recently. They say that around 27.3% of professors and equivalent faculty positions are held by women. 36.8% of reader and associate professor faculty pros, uh, positions, and 42.6% of lecturer, assistant professor, and faculty positions. So we do have a very good uh, representation of women in workforce. But then as you must have noticed, it gradually declines as women move up the ladder. And it seems that the ladder to that ceiling is somewhere broken we are not able to reach that ceiling so far. When we be able to reach that ceiling, if I may refer to uh, some other thing that I have recently read. So uh, the UN uh, SDG five, the UN uh, Sustainability Development Goal five is anchored to gender parity, gender equality. And there was uh, this fascinating uh, post by World Economic Forum uh, in which they actually uh, brought out that it will take at least 208 years for women to reach that equality status in, in the US, in the USA, right? I mean, I'm not talking in context of India. If that is the case for uh, the USA, I really don't know how long do we have to wait to achieve that you know, uh, that status of gender equality. And then, I mean, perhaps we not only need reactionary measures, but revolutionary measures to achieve the UN SDG 5 uh, in, uh, by 2030, perhaps. So yes, the glass door has been broken, but glass ceiling is yet far away. Thank you so much. Over to you, Deepika. Thank you so much. So what I'm really hearing is that there's a long way to go. Of course, there has been some space in some context and some jurisdictions, there is some sort of ceiling breaking, but of course it's not true about all the jurisdictions. But I think there are also structural barriers to, you know, to these kind of like promotions in the higher sort of spectrum. So for example, one of the most fundamental aspects that we've noticed in institutions is that a lot of young women contribute to administration when as, as young professors, like assistant professors, associate, but when it becomes professor, it's very difficult for them to become at a leadership level, mostly because of institutional limitations or structural problems like childcare, right? Or not having the right sort of you know, framework to work with in terms of in the university space, housing and other aspects. So I think it's really important. And what uh, many of you alluded to, especially Professor Wendy, when she spoke about how, you know, to reward different career trajectories, you know, when we talk about publications, not many women are able to publish. Like pandemic is this time where we're having so many conversations around different um, countries and why they haven't even attempted to publish. So, you know, because there's so much work that is that they have to do in terms of just household work, household care, and also just the just the just the mental trauma of being uh, lost and grief, grief that is that one has to go through, you know, so and, and then online teaching is so much onerous. So there are so those sort of structural uh, barriers as well, whereas some of the men may not face those issues. And then there is also this uh, idea that they can sort of surpass some of those care work and other aspects and publish and then sort of reach those positions. So I think that's really important um, conversation. I, I will now direct questions specifically to each of you. And I'm just drawing from this, this conversation, we can just build on the conversation we're currently having. So first question is for Ellen. Uh, so my question, Ellen, is while gender disparity has been a concern across various sectors and industries, what are some of the challenges unique to academia 
that are faced by women, especially when it comes to higher leadership positions. Look, thank you. Um, I, I think they've been touched on uh, in various ways by the other panelists. I think there are a whole range. Um, the barriers, existing policies. Um, so I think the existing policies uh, across all of uh, the, the globe, really, um, for universities, because we all have fairly similar uh, um, formats and structures in higher education. The existing policies um, do not support uh, women to move, as you just mentioned, to move through uh, in ways that is more enabled for men. So there is also um, a, a major issue for, um, as you, as someone recently um, pointed out a minute ago, stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So the stereotypes that people expect of women. Um, we've just uh, in Australia been having discussions around women politicians, and it's very similar for uh, women in higher education. If you are um, uh, assertive, you're, you know, you're, you're not good. Um, if if uh, you are, um, you know, if you're uh, not assertive, then you don't have what it takes to be a leader. Um, so there are, but those things are just not said in the same way about men. Um, I think there are a number of things around uh, the unconscious bias and, and in fact conscious bias that a number of people have mentioned and we have done a number of programs around unconscious bias we have not found them very successful and um and so we need to go back to the drawing board in my view as um to how we address this this is deep cultural patriarchy in, in our countries and, uh, and they exist in universities because universities are bastions of that and have been for a very long time. Um, so culture change is really important. Um, and then I think um, the, the hidden ways in which uh, networking works for um, men and, and not so well for women, partly because men don't take off the kind of time that women generally take off, not all women, but women have more interruptions. Men keep those networks going. And we have recently in Australia been discussing sponsorship, not just mentoring, but sponsorship so that, you know, that, that uh, someone actually sponsors you. That's how, how many men get ahead. Um, and then I think the final thing is um, coming back to the, the bias. Uh, I'll just give you an example of what has happened in Australia over the last year during COVID, or the last year and a half. Um, in, uh, we have 39 universities in Australia, public universities in Australia, and 15 of them, uh, 17, I think, actually, um, of the vice chancellors, uh, across universities in Australia, either left or announced that they were leaving. Of this is an opportunity. If what um, our universities are saying they believe and they are enacting, we all have equity, diversity, and inclusion. We all have um, yes, you know, women. We must have a better representation and parity. And what was the result? The result was that 73% of those positions went to men. Mm. Now, it is not because there are not women who are um, equally as capable and excellent leaders, but there is a conservatism in seeing yourself. So if, you know, men are in the majority of leadership, you know, they see someone like themselves. So that's not the only reason, of course, but, but it just shows that we, um, the mindset has not been changed. 
Thank you so much, Ellen, for that. I think it's really important to look at institutional barriers like policies and, of course, the mindset change. How do we achieve those mindset changes? And, of course, having leaders like you at the helm of it, a lot of things can change. Um, my next question is to Shirley. Uh, what can universities do better to promote gender equality and to nurture future leaders? To what extent can significant institutional policies shape the future of women in academia? What have been some of the key innovations in building diversity and inclusion in higher education institutions around the world? Yeah, thank you. So I'll probably draw upon an example that we've been um, developing at the University of Bradford, which emerged from uh, a European funded program, which was called um, Gen uh, Genevert. And we worked with another six universities across Europe to develop a, um, a social equality approach to understanding um, gender um, diversity. And that's understanding this from the perspective of the experiences and evidence from men and, and women. And it involves really taking a social mod model of, of gender equality and embedding that across the institution. And we've also done this within the context of thinking about the, an intersectional approach. So not just gender, but looking at other um, issues of diversity and inclusion as well. So this involves institutions engaging in a, gen, in, in a, in a gender climate assessment, looking at the, the evidence, the data, talking to people, listening, and undertaking um, constant equality impact assessments, which are not just based on, on, on numbers. And really putting in place equality, equality monitoring. Um, and there's many frameworks that you can use for that, but I think it's really important that we do start to set institutionally, and we have done um, KPIs that we want to see shifting on these math matters. And a key part of our approach has been to um, undertake learning partnerships where we've got our male academics and senior administrators and um, partnering with uh, female academics in order to understand experiences and holding gender gender cafes. So I think in essence, the key part of it is sort of recognizing the issues and the problems within the context of your own organization, the national context, the global context, and putting in place specific organizational plans. I guess some of this means that it, for me, it won't happen without gender competent leadership. I think it goes back to what, what Ellen was saying. We need leaders that understand the issues, that are not only, um, not only understand them, but are prepared to champion and to change policies and practices in their organizations and come off, come off the, uh, the, the fence and not be um, shy or um, embarrassed as some people may have been previously to say, this is a problem. And, and for it not to feel that you're turning into a campaigning organization just to be noisy. So I think we've got to be strong. We've got to have really strong leadership and people like ourselves have got to be able to stand on the world stage as we are today and speak up for this. So I think transforming organizational culture requires um, strong leadership. And I think the point that was made earlier, I can't remember who said it, we need people on our governing bodies who are also able to understand this and understand that it's going to be embedded in a way that will need resources. So when we're looking at our financial plans, we've got to make sure that our gender equality plans are appropriately resourced and that our governing bodies in whatever shape or form they are, are fully supportive of that and can equally play a leadership role. Thank you so much, uh, Shirley, for this. I think uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, just looking at, um, how these institutions are governed in the context of South Asia. We know that leadership is really important and political will of the leadership is really important in deciding who should be hired, how they should be hired, who are the future leaders. And thank you so much for that. Uh, my next question is to, uh, to both Wendy and Tanushri. So in the current pandemic, the whole world is relying on caregiving both inside and outside the house. The binary of work and home has collapsed for many of us. In this context, what kind of possibilities and challenges have there been for women across the board in the university during the pandemic? So maybe we can have comments from Wendy first, followed by Tanushree. Yes, well, I, I guess you've touched, Deepak, you touched on um, some of that earlier in terms of the, uh, the lived experience of so many women 
in universities, both academic and professional staff. And I, and I do want to keep our professional women uh, visible in this discussion as well. Um, that it has been enormously challenging trying to do our jobs from home um, to balance the demands of dual delivery, um, online learning and teaching, uh, the growing mental health issues amongst our student body, uh, all of that work um, uh, is crowding out research time, as you referred to earlier. So again, we've been thinking about this at my university. Uh, we have been for our women academics, we have been trying to ensure that they have uh, additional support to ensure that their research remains on track, uh, writing retreats, uh, delayed deadlines for grant applications, uh, building recognition into promotion processes, thinking much harder about merit relative to opportunity. Um, I think we're only beginning to see, however, the impact of COVID on our universities. Uh, the sector was going through a qualitative shift even prior to COVID. COVID has amplified a whole raft of things and quite where all this will land, I think we can all do a, a bit of crystal ball gazing. Uh, but again, in my own university, we've begun to take, take very seriously that long uh, talked about notion that we would see the unbundling of the academic role uh, that we would see, and, and I know um, Elaine's university already has this as well, uh, differentiated pathways for our academics, teaching intensive, uh, research intensive, as well as the, the model we're more familiar with, a 40-40-20 a model. What we're beginning to see is a proliferation of new professions around particularly our learning and teaching. Um, I don't know about uh, other countries, but in New Zealand, it's almost impossible now to find good learning designers and instructional technologists because they are so in demand uh, in our universities. And this is where Shirley's point about um, thinking about the gendering of these processes and gender impact as we move into these more fundamental shifts in universities is really important. So we were a bit worried our teaching intensive pathway might be a feminized pathway. Uh, not at all is the evidence to date. Uh, but again, we're monitoring that really, really carefully and thinking really hard about how that plays out. Um, as I said earlier, I did want to talk about our professional staff because certainly at our place, uh, one of the unexpected aspects of COVID has been that while flexible working was long a part of many academics' lives, you know, they, they worked around uh, other commitments and, you know, they were there for their meetings and their research uh, and learning and teaching, but, you know, they were in command of their own time. Uh, what we are now seeing for our professional women is much more flexible working. So the ability to have some autonomy over how they use their time, where they work from, and how they uh, do things. And that's been really well received uh, by, by certainly some of, our, some of our professional staff women. And as I was saying to colleagues earlier while we're waiting, uh, again, we're traveling less. And we know that for women, traveling was often an issue, right? It was much harder to travel. I couldn't have come to a conference in India with small children, but I can come in and join you for an hour in and around caring responsibilities and the, and the like. So I think what I'm trying to signal is that our universities are going through a qualitative shift. Uh, things won't go back to normal after COVID because they were changing anyway. Uh, my own line is that COVID hasn't caused a lot. What COVID has done is amplify a number of changes that were already uh, well and truly underway. So again, as we work our way through the changes of the coming years, how will we ensure that the gendered impacts of those 
are visible, being thought about, where they're deleterious, being worked against, and actually looking for those spaces where our institutions could be more friendly for women, where they could be different, because I genuinely think our universities can be different, and I genuinely think they can be uh, much more welcoming of women than they currently are. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, Tanushi. Sure. Thank you, uh, Deepika. So I would like to pull a thread from Professor uh, Nana's uh, statement, uh, where she said that this COVID pandemic has uh, has exacerbated or uh, exposed the fault lines in our uh, societal framework. Uh, the division of labor has always been disproportionate and it is always gendered. There are certain sets of responsibilities uh, which are expected from uh, women and certain from uh, men. Now what's happened during this uh, crisis, women, women had to assume a lot of additional responsibilities as the because rightly said, whether it is related to caregiving, uh, taking care of kids or looking after elderly people, or uh, in fact, uh, in India we know, uh, there were no domestic help available, so domestic chores and uh, other domestic responsibilities also went up uh, too much. And it was a bad struggle for everybody. So um, I think each and every uh, woman in India, and especially uh, women at work, would uh, resonate with me when I say that all sorts of boundaries disappeared, right? Personal, professional, days, nights, Right, I mean, you were kind of working around the clock. And many times one, um, one was compelled to ask, I mean, half days and nights started uh, trespassing into each other's territories. There was, there was no fixed routine. Everything is so entangled. I mean, uh, you just cannot focus on one thing. There would be multiple things and multitasking was actually uh, put to test during this COVID times, and especially for working women who had to struggle, who were trying to struggle uh, to strike a balance between their uh, work and life. Um, and there's something very interesting that I uh, read sometime, and this again is coming from the World Economic Forum itself, uh, which said that, you know, the pandemic has set a gender efforts by a generation or more back, right? So pandemic actually has uh, undone a lot of efforts that were made uh, towards uh, ensuring uh, gender parity and uh, gender uh, equality. And even uh, for that matter, the UN General uh, uh, Secretary, uh, he also said that uh, we are already seeing a reversal in uh, decades of limited uh, and fragile progress on gender equality. And then he said, without a concerted effort, it would be very, very difficult to help societies recover the progress lost as a result of uh, this pandemic. Now, there's one more thing, and I, I, whatever you said, it's so heartening to hear, uh, you know, different ways in which uh, your universities have helped and supported women academics to manage a very, very difficult situation in which women were finding themselves pulled in two complete opposite directions. So in our university also, uh, I mean, help and support was extended to everybody without, uh, uh, you know, the vision and uh, forethought of our leadership it would not have been possible for us to migrate from uh, offline teaching to online teaching. So whether it was like conducting training uh, sessions uh, for faculty members, for, for both, you know, uh, male as well as uh, female, I mean, men as well as uh, women academics. So lots of courses were offered to them, lots of support was given, even uh, for that matter, you know that how important internet connectivity could be for a seamless conduct of uh, one classroom. And then one interruption actually holds a lot of potential to disrupt the entire flow of the conversation, the intellectual discourse that happens uh, in the classes. So it was also looked at from that aspect. So uh, additional equipments were provided to uh, all the faculty members. So a lot of support has been extended, but uh, 
this support is just one part of it right and uh, actually you know um, i completely agree with you it is this problem is so complex to me it appears uh, like a kaleidoscope you just twist and turn this kaleidoscope and you see a complete new pattern so you know you can look at it through psychology lens of psychology sociology biology economy right so whatever support all the universities for that matter and that's what i've been reading have done their best to ensure that their faculty members uh, even uh, you know uh, women academics are adequately supported and equipped to conduct online classes and also to an extent manage uh, uh, the demands uh, that covid uh, pandemic actually uh, threw at them uh, <clears throat> but we also have seen the rise in domestic violence cases and that's that's where uh, you know uh, higher education institutions or universities cannot do much and those are the things which actually undo all the efforts which organizations workplaces extend to their women employees so i think you know looking at workplace and workplace condition is fine because that's the only thing which is in control of uh, the universities beyond that there is very little they can support yes um, uh, there is one thing which uh, if the pick up permits i would quickly like to mention and uh, as she also rightly said that university also has a certain role to play whatever happens in society uh impacts university also in a way uh, any higher education uh, institute is a, a microcosm of uh, the society right so whatever happens society gets reflected in uh, the institution as well so but then university is one place which has a very very significant role to play not only to get impacted by the society but also to do something to impact society right and that is the time when we actually need to say you know when students enter our institutions they enter with lots of uh, assumptions beliefs stereotypes self images images of self and others right uh, and these these stereotypes and assumptions are formed as a result of uh, their experiences exposures and encounters of many years social norms uh social conditioning and also the images of social mirrors we do see our images in these social mirrors so perhaps we as society need to understand that when our students graduate do they graduate with those reinforced biases and stereotypes or their their stereotypes and biases are redirected so do our students graduate with those shattered uh, stereotypes or more strengthened stereotypes if we are able to actually focus on this bit right for this perhaps we need to exemplify few things more we need to illustrate few things more if students don't get to see us practicing what we preach we may end up reinforcing their assumptions and stereotypes rather than shattering them thank you over to you Dipika. thank you so much uh, wendy and tanushree i think we've had a very rich uh, set of reflections from all of you and uh, i think one of the reflection that came in was on intersectionality and diversity and how do we think of diversity beyond just women though we today's conversation in this panel is focused on women but how do we think of diversity beyond that because there is also this idea within i mean women is not a homogeneous category women face oppression differently but also within that we also have a gender as a spectrum and we have sexual orientation for example we uh, sexual minorities we have caste race class and other factors and i think those conversations are also very important um and i'm i'm hoping next time we have that conversation as well but let me just start i have a lot of questions so i'm going to just put a few questions to you uh and and maybe uh, whoever wants to sort of respond can respond i'll read one or two questions and then we can have a set of responses and then if we have more time i can do a second set of questions so let me read the first one um it's from vishal rai kumar rai and he says in the context of theme of the session around breaking the glass ceiling of one gender is there any foundational difference in gender equality and gender neutrality i'm i'm happy to start that and i'm sure every, everybody has a view um there is a 
very big difference. Um, gender neutrality uh, is actually a very unhelpful concept um, because it, uh, it, it provides a, a sense that uh, you can erase um, the biases that uh, our society, um, I think in the way that Tanushree has, has uh, just spoken eloquently about, that the notion that you can erase that by gender neutrality um, is a, a complete fallacy. The other thing which I think is, um, which other people have spoken about and you just raised then, is actually we don't want gender neutrality. Um, we want to celebrate diversity. We want to celebrate gen gender diversity. We want to celebrate um, uh, uh, women and men of colour and of different, um, that, you know, different inputs. And therefore, um, I don't think that's a, a very helpful thing to, to deal with. Um, and I think it was made up by, um, you know, by, by people who didn't understand what they were looking at. Uh, thank you so much. I think Shirley, you would like to come in. Please do. Yeah, I just think it just building upon that, I think it's really important that we do reflect on what I said earlier and you did about the, the intersectionality, because the most important thing is that we understand diversity, we value it, we support it, but more importantly, we leverage it. And this is what this is all about. So within that overall goal of wanting to leverage our diversity, it's really important that we understand difference. And this is why you need the dialogue going on about gender and sexual identity, et cetera, and race at the same time. But it's got to be within the umbrella of we seek diversity to be able to push social inclusion and make a fairer and just society for everybody. Uh, would Wendy and Tanushi, would you like to come in? Uh, I absolutely agree with what's been said. OK, OK, great. Uh, so Tanushree, would you like to come in or should we move to second question? Oh, we can move on to the second question. Okay. So there are many, many questions. I'm just going to randomly choose a few. Uh, I think we don't have, we have about 15 minutes. So there's a question from Parth Netani who says, school education system has majority of female teachers, at least within the Indian context, where higher education has majority of male teachers as argued by Professor Tanushree, where she stated that the data where she stated the data of HEI, how do we explain this disparity? So uh, maybe this is directed to the Indian context. So maybe Tanushree, you can come in and then, yeah. So this question is from Parth, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> my understanding of uh, the situation is there's no problem at the lower level or even middle level uh, management uh, in higher education institutions. Uh, the problem is at the top level leadership position. So even if you look at um, number of professors and deans and vice deans and center heads and uh, you know uh, area chairs, head of departments, there are still many. But the main problem is the senior leadership role, uh, you know, the topmost uh, leadership position. And uh, I think uh, Professor Valvre uh, mentioned about uh, something that uh, worldwide it is close to 20%, uh, if I'm not wrong, 20% of the senior most uh, leadership positions are held by women, right? So in India, it is close to just 7%. And that is something very, very alarming. Unless and until that position changes, you actually don't see positions at level below changing much, right? So more number of uh, women leaders, if they uh, lead your organization, you have the person as a role model for uh, lots of others. You know, I just uh, spoke about social mirrors. <clears throat> There's so many biases. And when we talk about biases and stereotypes, uh, it's not that only uh, men folk or men uh, academics have certain biases, certain stereotypes. You know, look at our own selves. Because of this social conditioning, because of the information that we keep bombarded with, because of uh, the so many norms, right? We are, our image of ourselves is a little distorted. We also have many times this imposter syndrome. 
right? When we are not very confident of our own um, uh, ability, right? We may be equally capable, but then there is certain self-doubt. There is a lot of negative language that plays in our minds, right? So the moment you have a role model, there's a hope. And not only role models. See, what, what happens is there is there's something known as social learning. We just don't uh, learn in structured session. We learn in different ways. We learn by observing people, right? And when you have role models, we learn from them. They're available. And then if this thing can take in a little further, where, uh, um, you know, high pot, uh, youngsters, high, I'm, I'm sorry, high potential, uh, uh, you know, youngsters, they are mentored, they are coached, they're given opportunity to shadow these people. You know, I guess because these things are missing, that's why we see this vacuum or we, uh, whatever uh, uh, the current uh, state of affairs is, is not one should be very, very, you know, proud of. So I think it's the same thing that explains, you know, stereotypes, biases, uh, um, assumptions, self-image, social norms, social culture. Uh, but uh, this is something, and I don't have any answer to it. I just let me take one um, last minute. So I really don't know, you know, what is the criteria uh, which is kept in mind for selecting people uh, They go up. So uh, is is enough uh, training held holding uh, provided to women to acquire, to enhance those skills also, because it is a lot more than teaching and research. Administrative leadership is altogether different uh, things. I mean, it would be related to planning, strategic planning, financial planning, the institution building, and so much more, right? So. Are women academics getting trained on these also? Do we first of all make efforts to identify them and then train them so that they feel equipped and empowered and present their candidacy themselves to assume these senior leadership positions as well? Thank you. Thank you, Tanushree. I think um, we all know how deeply gendered academia is, right? From our classroom spaces to board meetings, to faculty meetings, to workshops and conferences with a lot of mansplaining and, and, and of course, publication processes. We know a lot of women who drop out, you know, because they can't really sort of cater to that expectation of publications and promotions. So I think what Wendy said earlier about promotion policies, you know, just having some, some kind of training around uh, un unconscious biases, I think all that is really important. But the fact remains that there are very few women in the higher education sector in the Indian context. I mean, all leadership is upper caste men in India. So how do we think about that? I think it was a very important question. And, and I think while, of course, there are societal norms, but as an institution, if you're going to have a university, how do we have inclusive policies? And what do we do about institutional discrimination, like not having paid leave for childcare or just having limited paid leave and immediately coming back to teach, you know, or not having crash facilities on campus? I mean, we know that we are marred with those. I mean, we, we in Supreme Court had crash facility only three years back because of uh, some activism by some very big women activists and lawyers. So I think there are institutional issues with the idea of why women don't come to this workforce in gender, in academia, and, you know, and it can be a very competitive, I mean, there are a lot of mental health issues, you know, which comes with uh, what kind of expectations there are, but thank you so much for highlighting that. I have uh, time for one more question. Maybe all of you can respond, it's a general question. So this is a question from uh, Sanyukta Saxena. And she says, is investing in gender equality not akin to smart economics? Why would one not want to achieve the best potential of the resources by sidelining the other half of the population? I, th I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I think that's what we've been saying. It's very simple. It is very clear. We do need to invest in doing all the things that you've just been talking to. Uh, but, I, but I think one thing that we do need to all embrace is the responsible use of research metrics. That's um, we're, we're and sign up to the to, to Dora, which emerged from San Francisco in America, and that will help to balance how we um, assess the quality of people's individual um, uh, outputs. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, would Ellen and Wendy and Tanisha yes, yes look, thank you. Um, look, I, uh, again, the answer is yes. I, I would like to um, take the opportunity to 
promote um, a, a set of action plans that a group of universities across the world um, put together last year. Um, and it, it's called Transforming Women's Leadership Pathways. Uh, what will it take for equality and leadership by 2030? And um, the, in, in a sense, it, it speaks to uh, all of those plans speak to what we've just been talking about. But I think there is something important um, that everybody has said, and um, and I think uh, um, Tanushri just uh, um, emphasised, and that is that universities have a social responsibility, and um, and universities have the opportunity to do these things, and and so we uh, these um, action plans look at. 10 areas, they look at higher education, they look at engineering, they look at medicine, they look at politics, um, they, they look at law, uh, they look at uh, the arts, all of the, the major areas of teaching and research that we do in our universities um, are looked at from the point of view of what are the specific things in each of those areas that would um, help us get really on the track. And they're different. They're, they're, they're similar, but they're different in each area because there are different um, issues that are faced. And part of it is addressing what um, you just talked about. That is, uh, we need to be training and teaching our students that this is the future. This is the way our society needs to be. Um, and that if we do not do this, going back to the question you just asked, um, if we don't do this, uh, we do not have the, um, the wealth and the depth and the capacity that our societies um, have uh, ahead of them if we use all of the diversity, um, gender, uh, people of colour, um, everything. And, and, and people with disability. Um, so it's everybody needs to be in the room. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Wendy, we'd like to hear from you on this one. So one of the most um, influential things anyone ever said to me was, don't complain about the university. We are the university. If you want the university to be different, roll up your sleeves and get on with it. And that's partly why this evening I've really emphasized the things that we're doing to make our universities different. Now it's not easy and we're not going to do it overnight and it's a multi-generational struggle, but our institutions can and will change. So I'm an optimist that that's just me by nature, uh, but I think that question about investing for gender equality, some of the really great ideas that we've had uh, in this session, the importance of role models. But I think my final comment is to really emphasize the fact we can be different and we have to be different. And that's a collective responsibility. It's not just a responsibility for women to make our universities different. This is a social movement. It really is a social movement. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. Uh, Tanushi. Thank you, Deepika. So I do agree with all that has been said. It does make a lot of business sense to exploit all the possible human capital. And I really like the way uh, Professor Lano ended her uh, uh, statement, being uh, you know optimistic about things. So this pandemic has uh, taught us a lot of things, right? Interconnectedness, that we are not invincible, but then it also exemplified our, 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 uh, our uh, spirit to conquer everything, right? So if you look at the kind of change which has been achieved, the magnitude, the scale of change which has been achieved by all the universities at the world level is unimaginable. 
right? In less than a month's time, if I take into consideration the entire uh, response to the COVID pandemic, right? In less than a month's time, all the offline teaching was migrated to online teaching in no time. This effort otherwise would have taken many decades. So we also need to understand, is this problem that rooted which cannot be changed? Or is there something else in addition to it? Is it more to do with our own com complacency, right? Our own acceptance of these things. If we can achieve what we did and that to that huge level, unimaginable, unprecedented level, then if we actually put our concerted, coordinated and collective efforts with grit, guts and gumptions, I think this is very much possible. Thank you, Dipika. Thank you so much for all your optimism and amazing conversation and very, very inspiring personally for me to be hearing all of this. I think what I take away is how do we think about challenging everyday and ordinary gender and sexism in the, in the universities? How do we sort of challenge that through looking at our institutions, reflecting on those institutional policies, reflecting on those policies? How do we say that everybody has a chance and then look at it within that spectrum? And I think that's really, really important. And our classrooms are a good starting point. And thank you for that reminder. We've had a wonderful conversation and thank you so much, everyone. Our time is up, unfortunately. I have a lot of questions. But um, perhaps in another conversation, we will continue this conversation and we can have more of the uh, more engagement then. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you spending time. Thank you, Thank you to all. Bye. Thank you.